In North Africa, battle raged along the coastal strip where the Italians and Germans had their airfields. Whoever won this piece of land would win control of the Suez Canal, the route to British colonies in the east. The Italians and Germans had the British in Egypt on the back foot. It seemed the whole Middle East could be lost. But a new kind of soldier emerged from this crucible of warfare, a hand-picked elite whose very existence was a secret. Their mission, to go deep into enemy territory to raid and spy. But first, they had to conquer the unknown, the Libyan desert, a waterless wilderness where not even flies could survive. Once they'd mastered this vast terrain, their exploits would become the stuff of legend. The Libyan desert is one of the most arid regions on Earth. It has remained hostile and inviolate for centuries. Towering dunes, sandstorms, and temperatures of up to 120 degrees in the shade contribute to its fearsome reputation. People cross it at their peril. But in the 1930s, a group of gentlemen explorers from England dared to venture into the Great Sand Sea on the Egypt-Libyan border in their motor cars. 93-year-old Rupert Harding Newman was the photographer among them. I suppose, in a way, my interest in the desert started when I went out outside Cairo in my Austin 7 and got stuck. And I realised then, you know, the joy of the desert and the fact, the wonderful scenery and the complete silence. And I, I loved it. The youthful Harding Newman was keen to see how far they could go into the deep desert. An expedition was planned, to be led by Major Ralph Bagnold, an intrepid explorer and an expert on the formation of sand dunes. They didn't know where they were going or what they would find. In autumn 1932, they set off into the unknown. If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. We knew we were going places where no one had been for a good many thousand years. All the maps covering the area, most of them had nothing on them at all. We had A model forts. To save weight, they had no mud guards on the front and no bonnets, you see. And the way those things moved is quite extraordinary. And um, how they stood, what we, the punishment we gave them. In three months, they covered 6,000 miles. When war came to the Middle East, the intrepid Bagnold wanted to put this experience to good use. He wanted to form patrols, which would follow his routes through the desert and pass undetected into Italian-held Libya. It was vital to monitor Italian troop movements there because in Cairo, it was feared the Italians outnumbered the British 10 to 1. Bagnold put his plan before the commander-in-chief, General Wavell. 
Wavell said, yes, this is the thing. And he gave him a chip to all departments in the army, give this man, Major Bagnall, anything he wants at once. And that was how it all started up. For his new patrols, Bagnold wanted men who were independent, tough and resourceful. His first recruits came from a green and mountainous island, a far cry from the desert, New Zealand. I didn't have any great patriotic feelings of fighting for king and country. I wanted some adventure. And I thought that's the cheapest way I can get overseas. It's as simple as that. Never thought about what might happen and might not happen. Just my chance to go overseas. Quite a lot of us Kiwis. They were farmers and sheep farmers and I was a fisherman. Oh, you name it. Bushmen, foresters, you know, out outdoor types. Something broke down in civilian life, they fixed it. And if they didn't know how to fix it, they learnt on the job to fix it. I was asked would I volunteer for a special mission. For well, those days I'd volunteer for any difference, you know. I was 22 at the time. You will have to get two vehicles and prepare them for a, a trip which could involve cross-country travel of about 3,000 miles. That was the brief. All labels had to be removed from cans. Nothing that would indicate that they were of any other origin than Italian. They were going into Libya to see if the Italians were gathering for an attack. You couldn't travel after, say, about nine o'clock in the morning. The air temperature was such that the engines would boil all the time. The petrol would vaporize in the pipelines. That's how hot it was. You wouldn't believe it. Terrible bloody place. Actually, we covered 1,600 miles in 10 days of travel. Of course, we were sworn to absolute secrecy. We were not allowed to discuss where we'd been to anyone. The patrol had gone right into the heart of enemy territory and returned with good intelligence, unscathed. The Long Range Desert Group, or LRDG, had accomplished its first mission. Bagnold was soon authorized to recruit more men but he only wanted a certain kind of man. This officer came round, and one of the things he asked me was, oh, what are your hobbies? I said, I, I, I used to breed budgerigars. Oh, he said, you'll do for me. Uh, and that was it. I thought, hey, I'm going to be in charge of a pigeon loft. When Bagnell said, right, I'm looking for people who can live together under adverse conditions in close proximity over long periods of time. Well, he wasn't looking for bruisers or, or <laughs> thugs or anything like that. He was looking for people who were ordinary people who could do this sort of thing. It was great. It was what I was meant to do. I always loved the desert, uh, you know, in the, um, it had a beauty all of its own. It was almost like a, a person, the desert, with the changing moods, the changing light. We're off! If you want to do a really hard bit of going, you kept your knees on, on the wheel like that, and you could roll your cigarettes. And then to amuse ourselves, we used to try and roll with one hand like the cowboys, you know? 
That wasn't so easy. I tried it the other day and it wasn't so easy, but it is possible, especially when there's nothing else to do but drive across the hard, <laughs> the hard desert. That was a great thing in the LRDG. No sergeant made just to tell you what to do, when to do it. He made you, it was self-discipline, that was the great thing. Drivers like Archie Gibson would take out small patrols of three or four vehicles. They would cover thousands of miles and stay out for up to a month at a time, gathering intelligence on enemy movements. They were so successful at evading capture, the Italians called them the ghost patrols. The most valuable thing I think the LRDG did was a thing called the road watch. You drove to a position where you could camouflage the trucks maybe a mile, two miles from the road. Two of you would go down at dusk You'd have a water bottle, a tin of bully beef, and a packet of biscuits. And you could either take a rifle or a revolver. Nothing was going to be much good in any case. And you had binoculars as well, and a notebook. And you got as near to the road as you could. And then you lay and watched. And then everything was marked down that you saw. This is the only film of the LRDG in action, shot by one of the New Zealand patrols. Well, it was all day, uh, every second day. Um, You'd do it about for about a fortnight and then you'd be relieved because you couldn't stand more than a fortnight. It was so bloody nerve-wracking. It was pretty hard. Hot, dusty, painful, boring. Sand would blow in your face. And in the winter it was bloody cold. The best part was the walk back to the trucks where you got the circulation going. The long-range desert group had to be entirely self-sufficient to survive behind enemy lines. They took food and fuel with them, but water was always in short supply. You didn't speak much during the day uh, when you were driving because you lost too much moisture from your mouth. Oh yes, that's, that's, that's the thing you've got to do. Keep that mouth shut. Water, the truck had first go at it and your meals had second and your water bottle came third and washing went by the board. You didn't wash, eh, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, when some of, them, some of the fancy jokers cleaned their teeth, I never bothered. <laughs> no, no, they didn't. You go for 11 weeks. We went for 11 weeks one time. Never had a wash. Like the Navy, the Long Range Desert Group was given a rum ration and lime to ward off scurvy. What you are seeing now are the ingredients for an anti-malarial desert pick-me-up. Your tot of rum, the queen, you pour it in the water, and then some powdered lime, and then you put it on the back wheel of your truck and let the cool desert air blow over it, and you finish it with a nice cool rum and lime drink. <laughs> Sheer survival was one problem. Finding your way in a desert devoid of landmarks was another. Skill and instruments developed during the pre-war expeditions were to prove invaluable. 
Veteran navigator Mike Sadler, back in the desert for the first time in 60 years, remembers the magic of it all. I was rather intrigued by the fact that in these vast empty spaces you could actually travel and get to the place you were looking for at the end of the day. I think there's a, quite a, a knack attached to it. I, some people said it was, was more of an art than a science I, because you can't in fact travel in straight lines. There's um, dunes and gullies and wadis. There's a tremendous amount of estimating attached to it. The golden rule, really, is to trust your instruments and trust your calculations. And then you, you don't normally get lost. At night, navigators took readings from the stars using a theodolite like a ship's sextant to plot their exact position. When driving during the day, an ordinary compass would be thrown by magnetism from the vehicle. So they turned instead to a Ralph Bagnold innovation, the sun compass. You can set the direction you wish to go in, and the driver then has to just drive his vehicle in such a way that the uh, shadow from the pin uh, fall, falls on the arrow, in, which is pointing in the direction that you want to go. Because the sun's moving round, you would gradually drift off course as the shadow follows the sun. So it's necessary to keep resetting uh, the, the, the information on the side of the compass so that the compass continues to register a true bearing. Driving into the deep desert brought with it a special form of jeopardy. So far behind the lines, patrols were susceptible to attack, not just from the enemy. That's where the RAF were hunting stuff, you see. So if they saw stuff moving around there, they assumed that it was uh, enemy. I had some hellish times with aircraft where they singled out one truck. That was very frightening. Sweating hands on the wheel and seeing the bullets puffing up the sand. And then he dropped bombs which lifted the, the rear of the truck, sort of rose up with the blast. I hated aircraft. I hated the sound of them. The Long Range Desert Group brought back a steady flow of high-grade information for British military headquarters. They were masters of their terrain. But their subtle and discreet methods were about to be disrupted by the arrival of a much more aggressive group bent on making a lot more noise. In spring 1941, the British faced a new threat in North Africa. The Germans arrived. More drastic measures were called for, and one young officer thought he had the answer. David Sterling had a daring plan, which involved surprise parachute raids and a group of men as crazy as he was. He was to become one of the most famous raiders of all time. But in the beginning, both he and his plan lacked credibility. By the powers that be, he was known as rather an idle officer. But he was, he was a man of great charm, actually. He was a very amusing companion. He wanted to form a small unit that would get behind enemy lines and destroy any valuable installations aircraft, ammunition dumps, petrol dumps, even water supplies. He was um, sure that the four or five man team getting behind the lines, properly equipped and um, expert in what they were doing, would create more havoc 
and a couple of battalions of infantry charging up the desert. He was obviously very enthusiastic about the idea and um, you know, we hadn't heard all this before and uh, we didn't actually credit him that he might get it off the ground. Sterling bluffed his way into military headquarters in Cairo and slipped into the office of the Deputy Chief of Staff, General Ritchie, with an outline of his plan. General Ritchie just read it. He was only a lieutenant, don't forget. Very junior rank. And he said, yes, we'll give you a chance. You can have 50 odd men. That's how it all started. Having got his men, he needed a camp worthy of his ambition. But there was little on offer. There was a stretch of, of desert sand, about oh, 500 yards by 500 yards, and that was our camp. Well, there was one tent for ammunition and for food and for our arms, everything, but nothing else. Dirty tricks were called for. And if the nearest victims happened to be Kiwis, too bad. That night, we motored down the road towards Geneva, and the New Zealand division camp was almost empty because the New Zealanders were all in action up in the desert. And uh, we went in and we just collapsed their tents. And we nicked 16, I think it was. Oh, look, this stool over here. And then the furniture shop went into the local cinema, which was more or less an army cinema, and we stole all the easy chairs, which was the officers' easy chairs, and took them all back. And so that, that next day we erected these tents, and it worked out four men to a tent plus an easy chair. Eh? And we had the finest camp in the, in the whole of the Middle East. And after that, there were thieves all their days. Now they had a camp, they needed a name. They were called L Detachment of the Special Air Service Brigade, a grand title for just 60 men and six officers. The SAS was born. L Detachment SAS Brigade. We often wondered about that. And the only one answer we could come up with, well, it could fool the Germans. If we've got L Detachment, what about ABC and whatever, right down to L? Where are they, <laughs> you know? And of course, L. A lot of the chaps used to say, well, L for learner. <laughs> That's what we're doing. David Sterling organised makeshift parachute training in the desert. But many in the military doubted whether such a unit could ever penetrate German airfield defences. Undeterred, Sterling decided to launch a surprise attack on an airfield, reaching it not by air, but on foot. It lay a hundred miles to the north, a test for the stamina of his men. The idea was to see how determined we could be. We had two water bottles each and a pound of dates and some uh, sweets to suck. And it took uh, three nights to do the 100 miles. It was a hell of an exercise then. The worst I've ever done, from the physical point of view. Because it was a hell of a job lying up there in the, the sand and the camouflage, sweating like pigs. You know, hoping the sun would go down. And when it does go down, you're freezing cold anyway. The airfield was not German, but British. The SAS easily eluded the guards, slipped up to the planes undetected, and left their calling cards. We cut through the barbed wire, went to all those planes and stuck stickers on, saying that it's blown up, it's blown up, it's blown so far, and even into the canteen, stuck at the doors of the canteen and the officers' mess, they were all blown up.
The point was made. If the SAS could break into a British base, they could do it to the Germans too. Their chance was to come in November 41. The plan was for them to parachute in and destroy the planes on the enemy airfields at Gazala and Tumimi in advance of a push westwards by the 8th Army. On the night of the drop, a terrific storm blew up. But Sterling felt cancelling the raid would damage his men's morale. It was the worst storm for 30 years. The plane that I was in uh, was caught up by searchlights and we were shot. The five planes came under heavy fire. The bullet went up and down the fuselage. But we both stand on both sides and I was just running up the centre. That's the time the RF large sisters were get out now. So we had to drop blind and as you left the aircraft the wind took you absolutely miles and miles an hour and we had certain people there were dragged to death there was legs injuries and one thing or the other, and one lad got his back broken. It was just an agony. And we couldn't carry him. It was a waste of time because it, it, it was over 100 miles to try and get back to our base. We left him a, a water bottle full of water, plus his revolver. We couldn't very well turn around and shoot him ourselves, just left him to do his own, his own mind, make up his own mind. So that was the finish of him. The fifth plane did not drop its parachutists. The pilot decided it was suicide to drop us. So he said, well, we'll make back for Cairo. Then there was a 109 Messerschmitt fighter coming back from Dawn Patrol. And he pumped us full of cannon shells and uh, down we went. The last thing I remember in the aircraft was the um, side, every side of the aircraft disappearing and these big balls of fire coming past my shoulder, right shoulder, and I felt as if I was been hit on the back with a big bunch of six inch nails. And uh, then I was going forward and I was unconscious. I, was, I went out. The plane crashed and Ernie Bond was taken prisoner. Only 22 out of 62 men returned from the raid. The rest were captured or killed. It had been a disaster. But the SAS were not the only ones in the desert that night. 50 miles away, the Long Range Desert Group were waiting patiently at a prearranged rendezvous to drive them home. We marched for about a day and a half until at night we could see these two um, mounds at a distance with these storm lanterns on. I said, um, sir, I said, I, I, I think I can see a light down there. And he said, yes, young boy, that's our RV. And as we approached, of course, there they were. But, um, the sheer sort of joy of, of uh, meeting up was, uh, uh, I, I just can't really describe it. it. It was emotional, very, very emotional. 
The SAS's first raid had been a fiasco, but the meeting with the LRDG was to completely change their fortunes. One of the LRDG officers waiting to welcome the SAS in the desert that night offered Sterling a solution to his problems with parachuting. David Sterling came into our little encampment. We brewed him up a damn good uh, mug of tea, strongly laced with, with a dram or three, and he told me the whole dreadful story. Tragic. Anyhow, I said, well, look here. Why the hell do you want to go and do this futile jumping? We can take you anywhere you like, almost like a taxi. And you can go and do whatever ghastly deeds you want to do, and we will pick you up at the end. And the fact is, of course, that from that moment on, David Sterling never, ever did a, a parachute parade in the desert. When David Sterling came on the scene, he walked down the line of trucks and he saw Hwador, which his, his motto is, who dares wins? And my motto was Hwador, Hwador meddle with me or Hwador, etc. It's a Scottish thing, don't mess about with me. And so he, he drove with me. I was very fond of David because he didn't look at all or sound at all like a great warrior, but he was a man of steel. Every generation brings forth a few gifted people like that. He had these two characters, Reg Seekins and Johnny Cooper, and they were always there. Even in the middle of the night, driving, you'd look around, cold night, and there they would be, guns in their hands, alert, nothing happening, but ready. The LRDG knew the backyard. They were the professionals of movement in the desert, no doubt about it. They took an awful lot of heat off of our feet. Instead of having to perhaps walk for 30, 40 kilometers or miles, uh, they could get us so close that it meant that we were so much fresher when we hit the target. And then we had the pleasure of hearing the bangs when <laughs> they let off their, their bombs and so on. The SAS bombs were unique. Lieutenant Jock Lewis took weeks to perfect a lightweight device which would cause maximum damage. Conventional bombs would only blow a hole in a plane, but not set it on fire. Sterling wanted a bomb which could do both. Lewis eventually hit on a mixture of plastic explosive, engine oil, and an incendiary powder which was light enough to carry in a ration bag. Sixty years later, Ernie Bond and explosives expert Sidney Alford are trying to recreate Jock Lewis's critical experiment. How's that feel? Yes. It's, it it's, it's, all a, back it's, there. it's a lot harder than the stuff we used, you know? Yes. Yeah, I think perhaps we've got too much engine oil in there. So we are. That's not bad. That's not bad. Put in the... The Lewis bomb could both blast through a plane wing and ignite a can of petrol placed underneath it. In the experiment with uh, Jock Lewis, it was put right in the middle. OK. With the petrol tank, with the petrol can underneath. Firing! Three, two, one! Very effective, Sydney. Very well? Very effective. You like that, yeah? <laughs> yes, it, just like the old days. Yeah. yeah. You can see the effect it would have, you know, a number of those going off in an airfield. Oh, great fun.
majority of the um, raids, it was three or four man patrols. They would carry about 20 pounds, uh, that's, uh, that's 20 bombs, 20 aircraft each. So three men with uh, 60 bombs we destroyed a, a hell of a lot of, uh, of aircraft. The SAS, they were a gung-ho lot. How can I put it? They were short-term, we were long-term. We'd, we'd poke fun, and, uh, and they call us the parachutes, and we call them the uh, Desert Taxi Company. <laughs> I don't think there was rivalry, but there was, uh, there was a conflict of interests at one stage, because the NRDG's role was not, on the whole, uh, an offensive one. It was a more of an uh, observation role. And of course, once, once raids were taking place in the neighborhood, it became extremely difficult for the LRDG to um, c keep on doing that job. The SAS hit and run raids had some stunning successes. In one two week period, a hundred planes were destroyed. But they soon became harder to pull off. In the end, the Germans and Italians got uh, understandably fed up with that. And uh, they placed mostly Italian uh, battalions all round these, resting from the front, all round these airfields. So uh, the days of walking on were over. Presented with this new challenge, David Sterling began to plot his most spectacular raid yet. In the summer of 42, the first American jeeps arrived in North Africa. David Sterling managed to get hold of them. They were to inspire his most daring raid yet. A convoy of jeeps would brazenly drive onto an airfield and shoot up every plane in sight. The days of the walk-on raid were over forever. Instead of creepy crawly up to these airplanes, we would simply drive on in two columns of jeeps. And I think that worked out as 60 machine guns in this, in this small column. 18 jeeps with a combined firepower of 90,000 rounds a minute set out to attack a key German airfield. The target at Sidi Hanish was a stopping point for enemy planes flying to or from the front. But the journey there did not go smoothly. The SAS wanted to attack under cover of darkness, but dawn was fast approaching, and they didn't know where they were. Sterling was fretting. The burden fell on navigator Mike Sadler, who'd been poached from the long-range desert group. We were getting awfully late. I mean, we were getting behind schedule. And David was getting, I remember, very impatient at this stage. Yes, we stopped and he said, where the bloody hell are you going to send for Sadler? I said, I think we're about two miles south of the, uh, of the airfield. And, and just at that moment, the runway lights on the airfield were switched on. And, and a German aircraft came in and landed. And then David's uh, uh, sort of temper uh, you know, uh, disappeared completely and he was just overwhelmed with the fact that we we're in such a wonderful position to attack. He stopped on the edge of the airfield and um, David Sterling gave us a bit of a pep talk and said, now, uh, right, we're off. And so we formed up in line, opened up, just kind of spraying the area. And uh, I mean, that sounds rather like the American army, doesn't it?
20 to 25 machine guns firing 900 rounds a minute of incendiary and tracer of these streams of colour and there wasn't much resistance. I mean, they were running around in their pyjamas at one, at one stage of the game between these tents they had. I think one or two of them I, I met a, an unfortunate end. Um, and we were onto the airfield. Planes were all part either side of the drones. The idea is so we could all go in line and take a plane each. The idea was to destroy the aircraft, then swing around the other way and do the reverse thing again. As they got onto the airfield, the full firepower of 70 machine guns was released. We simply uh, opened up on the aircraft as we wound round them and were very gratified to see them burst into flames pretty, pretty quickly. I think they, they were very scared at the rate of uh, the fire of the Vickers Ks and the fact they had such a concentration of machine guns. It was quite incredible and very, very noisy. And very noisy, it certainly was. It was like curtains being torn, thousands yeah. of curtains being torn. It was rather like a firework show, you know, with the noises as well. <laughs> it was a magnificent display. Uh, I must say it was a very satisfactory sight. The plane would glow for a minute and woof, go up in flame. We got in among some Stuka dive bombers, which we feared and disliked particularly. And it was very um, uh, refreshing to see them go up in flames. And at last they got themselves together and they shot at us with um, mortars and, uh, and uh, one or two big heavy Italian Breeder machine guns. And um, it began to feel not so welcoming by any means. I was with David in the, the middle vehicle and halfway up that runway, our jeep stopped. And David was driving and he said, um, what the bloody hell's going on? The bonnet opened and it was steaming. And of course, we had a breeder 15 millimeter shell was right through the engine. It was quite funny because David started, oh, get it going, get it going, you know. He was so annoyed that he'd been hit. <laughs> You had no fear at all because you had no time to be frightened. You could be frightened afterwards. Yes, when you <laughs> thought about it. <laughs> In less than two hours, nearly 40 planes had been destroyed at the expense of only one SAS casualty. We felt pretty good, we did. It didn't last. It wasn't long before we were, we were lost and pretty short of water and things to eat. Then the hard work began, because then we were, we were being chased then. And it was very hot, it was June. And then we heard these aircraft draining round, draining round. And eventually they'd spot one of our vehicles, or spot one of us, and then they'd dive down machine gunning. Much to our dismay, one vehicle after another burst into flames and exploded, all including our breakfast and everything else. One had nightmares for years after that, with these dive bombers coming down, uh, and there was absolutely nothing we could do about it. The bombers passed, the soldiers buried their single casualty. I was a sergeant then, so I grabbed the spade and uh, we buried him there. 
We made a mound and we certainly put a cross on it, but it was only scrub. I mean, I mean there must be hundreds and hundreds were buried in the same way in the desert. It was quite a moving moment in a way. There was nothing we could do. We simply collected around the hole that the lads had dug and uh, they made a rough cross with ration boxes or something. And there we left him. And um, one wondered, you know, whether anybody or anything would ever pass that grave again. In the 18 months of their existence, the SAS destroyed 400 enemy planes, a far higher strike rate than the RAF had managed. But their days in the desert were numbered. In October 1942, Montgomery and the 8th Army defeated the Germans at El Alamein. It was the beginning of the German and Italian retreat. Desert raiders were no longer required. The SAS moved on to other theatres. David Sterling was captured in Tunisia at the beginning of '43 and ended up in Kolditz. On his release, he returned to civilian life. Jimmy Story became a builder. Stephen Hastings was a Conservative MP and now breeds racehorses. Alf Saunders turned his hand to dairy farming. Mike Sadler went from the desert to join an Antarctic expedition, then became a diplomat. Ernie Bond became a senior officer with the Metropolitan Police. Arch Gibson became a bus driver then gave it up to travel the world before training as a psychotherapist. And Johnny Cooper remained with the SAS for 17 years, fighting with them in Malaya and Oman. 